What's up, what's up? Welcome back to the next video. Today we're gonna to talk about the S-Drive Max. This is one of those must-have devices if you're gonna be using the Atari 8-bit line of computers. So stick around, we're gonna look at this guy and I'm gonna give you a very good in-depth review and instructions on how to use it. So don't go anywhere. So what is this S-Drive Max? Well, we're gonna crack it open in a second here, but before we do that, let me just talk a little bit about what it is and what it does. So you've got your SIO connector here for the Atari computer. Now you can connect this directly to the back of the 8-bit computer, or you can connect this as the last device in a chain of devices, such as behind a 1050, or behind uh, an 850 interface or however you may want to connect this as a last device as it doesn't have a daisy chain port on the back. So you can put this as the last device in a chain of Atari serial devices and use it. And basically what this is, is there's an Arduino board in here and it's got a touch screen. And when this is powered up, you can touch the touch screen and it takes an SD um, stick I'll show you that right now. Micro SD. Can our camera focus on that? Maybe, maybe not. If I get my face out of the camera, probably. Uh, there we go. 16 gigabytes is what I have on this one right now. So what you can do is you can copy disk images, XEX files, um, ATR files to this uh, SD mini card, micro SD card, and you pop this into the SD slot of this Arduino board, which is in here, and you can basically simulate an Atari disk drive or a cartridge, I'm sorry, cassette, let me use the right terminology. Um, I'll, you know, I'll show you when we get this powered up, you can, you can simulate drive one, drive two, drive three, or drive four, you can do four drives, you can attach a drive image, image file, and basically use this as a disk drive for one through four. There's also a menu selection where you can uh, emulate the cassette, uh, the cassette drive for the Atari, where you can download um, cassette files, and you can mount them on, on this memory, uh, memory stick, and you can mount them as a cassette drive and actually emulate a cassette recorder. If you have, I don't know why anybody would wanna do that these days, but you can do it. Um, it's got a USB port on the front that's used for flashing the firmware. So if you need to upgrade this, upgrade the software, this will power itself from the SIO bus, um, I believe from most Atari 8-bit computers. I might be incorrect when it comes to the 400 and the 800, the older ones, because I don't know if they actually put out enough current. Um, but if anybody knows that for sure, leave a comment. Um, and then we've got the SD slot back here. So we're gonna crack this open and I'll show you the insides of it because what I really wanna do is, uh, if you look around the internet, there's one page that um, gives you a little bit of information on how to use this, but I have yet to find a YouTube video or a web page that really takes you in depth of how to use this front to back. So I'm gonna try and fill in whatever gaps I think are missing out there and that you might need to know about for using this. Now, one of the things that I use this for, which uh, to me is the reason why I bought it, is um, I created a disk image, okay, using the uh, Respect QT, R-E-S-P-E-Q-T, which those of you who have done SIO to PC, which uh, allows you to connect the Atari to a computer, a Windows computer, through the USB port, and you can simulate having a disk drive um, using that program called R-E-S-P-E-Q-T. Um, there's actually, I found a menu option there where you can create a new disk image, okay? And it allows you to choose like a single density, a double density, a double-sided double density. But interestingly enough, they had an option there to create a double density hard disk. So I found out that by using that menu option, I can create an ATR image 
that's basically 16 megabytes, a little over 16 and a half megabytes in size. Um, and what that allows you to do, if you format it correctly, um, I use SpartaDOS, you can actually um, put that ATR file on this SD card and mount it in drive one, two, three, or four, whatever your preference is. And you can use this like a 16 megabyte hard disk for the Atari, which will allow you to store just about virtually everything, I believe, that was ever, <laughs> or at least most of the popular titles that ever came out for the Atari 8-bit computers on one drive, okay? So I haven't seen that mentioned anywhere on the internet, on any website, on any YouTube page. So hopefully this is gonna be the first place you're gonna hear it and I'm gonna show you how to create a 16 megabyte virtual drive for your Atari. And if you're a programmer like me and a game collector and a program collector like me, being able to carry this guy around with me on my 8-bit computer and have everything I need stored on that SD card is huge. And then having a 16 megabyte uh, drive for storing all my programs, my basic programs, my semi language source code listings, and have all my games and utility programs in one spot, I think it's a home run. And I think you'll probably agree with me as well. So anyway, I'm gonna show you how to do that. I also wanted to show you what I got in the mail last week. Let me move my face so this will focus. Focus, 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 there we go. Mac 65 with DDT. Now this is a, this is a copy, a, a duplicate of what would have been the original OSS Mac 65 with DDT, the debugger built into it. This is cool to have guys, okay? Because even though you can use, or in my previous videos, you were seeing me use Mac 65 with the ultimate cartridge, okay? What I found was, and I think I've talked about this before, is I like using SpartaDOS from a cartridge. I can boot the computer, I can use all the floppy disks that I have without having to install DOS on them to boot them. And what I always wanted to be able to do was to program an assembly language with Mac 65 using the ultimate cartridge, but unfortunately the ultimate cartridge takes over at boot time and doesn't allow me to get to the sport of DOS. So that was always an issue. I had to boot from DOS from floppies. But now with the OSS cartridge or the copy of the OSS cartridge, Mac 65, now I've got a sport of DOS solution and my assembler all in one. Pop this in the back of the computer, ready to go. Start writing programs, load up my source code, compile it, run it, do everything I need to do. So this is a great stack to have. I wish I could find somebody uh, that is creating or can create SpartaDOS cartridges, okay? If you know where we can get a SpartaDOS on cartridge, let me know because I haven't yet, I've been yet been able to find that, okay? So if you've got an inroads to that, uh, let me know about that and I will put that information out for everybody. Uh, by the way, if you guys don't know, I do have a website up, www.8bitmore, 8bitmore.com. Did I say that right? 8bitandmore.com, excuse me, www.8bitmore, I can't speak today, guys. www.8bitandmore.com. I hope I said it right that time. Anyway, I, the programs that we're writing here on this channel, the source code, I'm putting it up on that website. I've got a listing of you know game ROMs that I've tested that I know that work, especially on the Ultimate cartridge. You can download them from there as well. I'll be adding more stuff to that site as time goes on, things that I think are useful to you in the 8-bit Atari community. Um, so anyway, check that out. But in the meantime, oh, and I will leave a link at the bottom of the video where you can order this, a copy of this Mac 65 with DDT for yourselves. But anyway, Let's get on the business. Let's go ahead and take apart the S Drive Max. I'm gonna show you the internals, and then we're gonna get into how we load images uh, into the, the SD card and how we boot the S Drive Max and some of the nuances of it and how to use it. And um, then finally, I'll show you how I create that 16 megabyte hard disk, if you will, uh, that you can use to mount on the S Drive and use it for 
just about anything you want to store on it, 16 megabytes, you know, in one drive, if you will, uh, is, is huge. So let's get to it. Okay, so here we have the S Drive Max. 3D printed a case. I had this one ordered in uh, red, as you can see. And um, pretty good job. Now the only critique that I have regarding this setup with this case is that these screws, as you can see, they don't quite, they're not really set with um, an inset where they set flush. Um, so that's my first little comment. Um, I think probably the 3D case design would have to have a little bit of a recessment here, which it looks like there is a little bit, but maybe not enough. The other little critique I had was that where this cable goes into the case, it kind of has a little hump here, okay? Because apparently the, the, uh, the cutout for the cable is not quite deep enough, so it sits flush on the sides but not the middle. This could this could use a little bit more of a deeper cut, okay? But in any event, two screws, this comes off, and you can see the Arduino board in there. Um, <clears throat> I gotta be careful with this switch here um, because it is tacked into the side of the case, either melted or glued, I'm not really sure which, but we can basically bend this out a little bit to get this out if I'm very careful about it. this out before so don't try this at home kids all right there we go so as you can see this is a touchscreen daughter board that basically mounts on top of the Arduino lines up with the pins and there's one other modification that I read about and that is this board right here um, not all of these S Drive Maxes, depending on who's manufacturing them, come with this board. Um, from what I understand, this board is another mod or another modification or a requirement that allows the S Drive Max to be daisy chained um, behind other devices. In other words, without this little board here, um, the S Drive Max will have to be plugged directly into the back of the Atari. All right. So if I'm wrong about that, guys, let me know in a comment, but I believe that's what I, from what I understand is how it works. All right? So anyway, um, one thing I didn't mention in the beginning of the video is that this five volts here can supply external power to the S Drive Max where it doesn't require power from the Atari computer. So um, it's probably something that you would want to do if you have the ability to put a five volt power supply on it, and that way you're not draining the, the, uh, the current voltage from the Atari. Now, let's go ahead and connect this screen back to the Arduino. But anyway, it's, it's just that simple. Basically, it's an Arduino board with a touch screen and a 3D printed case and an SIO cable, and you're good to go. Um, this switch on the side here, uh, S and E, I think that's what that says. Um, I'm gonna look at that in a second and remind myself as to what that switch is for. Anyway. Let's go ahead and put this guy back together. So we're gonna basically squeeze a little bit, get it back into its case, fish the cable down through the hole. We're back at it. And as you can see here, like I was saying before, I don't think these screws were the best option. I think they are a little Well, let me just say they're the wrong type. Either this case needs to be countersunk better so that the screws aren't riding up the way they are, or just maybe a different set of screws and have a flat cap that will sit more flush to that. And as you can see, like I said before, this is bowing here, okay? Because this inset for this cable is not deep enough. Now, I did find the documentation that came with this and um, the E and the S basically stands for internal or, or external power. Let me actually get the form here so we can read it. And by the way, this is the documentation I got with my S Drive Max. Um, 
and I'm gonna go through this a little bit here, but I'm gonna show you just how poorly it's written. I don't know who actually wrote this, but they definitely didn't spell check it or did do any grammar checking on it, which is another pet peeve of mine, but uh, display usage on first startup, follow touching the calibration crosses. So the first sentence in the documentation is pretty whack. You can redo this at any time by hold touching during startup. This have to be also done if you have changed the display rotation. Hmm. Excellent English. Press drive buttons in the middle to select anyway. I'm not going to read it all right now. Um, I wanted to get to the part that talks about that switch. Okay, here we go. Power switch towards SIO cable for SIO power. S on case or away for external. E on case. Do not power externally with switch towards SIO cable. So basically that means if we're powering this from internally from the Atari, it needs to be on the S. As you can probably see, can you guys see that? I don't know. I don't know if the lighting is gonna, okay, there we go, S. So S for internal power, E for external power, if you've got five volts on this guy right here. So I've been using it internal power with my 130XE and I haven't had any issues, so anyway. So here we go, it's buttoned back up. I'm going to plug it back to the Atari directly, directly into the Atari first, and then I'll show you how it works. Stand by. All right, folks, we are back. And as you can see, we have the S Drive Max connected to the back of the Atari directly to the SIO port. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn on the Atari, by the way, my S Drive Max came with a free stylus, woohoo, so you don't have to use your fingers. But anyway, what's gonna happen now is um, this S Drive Max has a built-in what we call D0. D0 is the boot drive that the S Drive Max boots for its internal firmware that allows you to go in there and configure it. So we're gonna go ahead and turn on the Atari, and you'll see here the interface for the S Drive Max, and you'll also hear the Atari booting up to its interface from the S Drive Max. So as you can see here from the display of the S Drive Max, we've got D1 through D4. You can see here D1, D2, D3, D4, and right now they're all empty, okay? Because I don't have any images associated with them. However, we do have a D0, and that D0 is what was used to boot this interface here up on the Atari, okay? This is the internal S Drive um, boot image and you can see it right here s drive.atr anytime you have s drive.atr um, as a file on the SD card you will get this interface at boot time okay now there is a way to make the s drive boot from d1 okay but I always like to have d1 empty because I still use a physical 1050 disk drive occasionally and I like to be able to use my floppies and I like to boot from that floppy sometimes. So I typically don't have a D1 mounted, I usually have a D2 mounted which is where I put my drive image for my programming. But in any event, you can see over here on the computer on my interface I can use my arrow keys to go up and down to choose, um, how can I get this to focus over here? Hello camera, focus up here, focus up here. Let me see if I can manually focus this guy. Okay, there we go. So up here, you can see I've got a couple images. Um, ignore this subdirectory and ignore this subdirectory for now. Um, the S Drive Max um, uh, basically allows you to have directories and also just uh, files on the root of the directory, but in any event. So S Drive 1.ATR is a file that needs to be on your SD card in order for this interface to boot, okay? So I have a demo directory here. I guess we can go ahead and start this out. Let me go into the demo directory, and the way I do that is I press the enter key. Okay, so I've got various um, XEX files in here, and basically these are uh, demonstration files that we can mount to one of the drives, for example, D1, and then we can boot the computer. So let's just jump right into it. We've got the famous uh, Fuji Boink uh, demo here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight that file and I'm gonna press enter. 
And you can see what it did was it created a little arrow key over here. And it's tell it, this allows me to choose which drive I wanna mount that file on. If I press enter again, now I've got the Fuji box or Fuji blank, I can't remember the actual file name, loaded on the D1. Okay, can you guys see that? So now I've got a virtual drive one set as this Fuji box demo, okay? So now what we can do, I believe I can hit reset. And what it's doing now is it's booting. You can see the light blinking right there. You see that green light blinking? This box is now acting as drive one and it's loading that demo from the SD card. And there we go. Let me go back to manual focus so you guys can see that. All right, so there's the Fuji Blink. Power without the price. All right, if you guys have never seen that demo before, it's pretty cool. Okay, so that's that. So that's our drive one boot. So let's go ahead and power off. Now, let's see what happens when we power the computer off and power it back on. What do you think will happen? It's gonna boot from D0, okay? Because what I did by mounting that image as drive one was a temporary mount point because I didn't save any of this configuration. I basically mounted it as drive one and I hit reset and I boot the computer. But now that I've turned the computer back off and on, the S drive is reverting back to its default configuration of booting from D0, okay? So now let's go back into our demos. Let's choose another demo. Let's do um, 60 sprites. I think this is a demonstration that shows you how to create and have 60 sprites on the screen at once. Let's go ahead and reset. And once again, you see we're booting from D1. And there's our little demonstration again on the computer. Okay. Pretty cool little demo. All right. Power off. Power on. And once again, we're booting from the S Drive Max. Okay. So let's throw a little curveball into the mix. Let's go ahead and use Sparta DOS cartridge. So we're going to turn the computer off. I'm going to put my Sparta DOS cartridge into the computer and let's turn the computer on and see what we get. Now in this case, I want you guys to see what happened. You see how the Sparta DOS cartridge took control? Okay. Now, I don't have any drives mounted here, as you can see, but Sparta DOS has put me at a drive prompt for D1. Okay. So if I type directory for D1, what I get is this S0 drive. Because that, in theory, is the drive that's mounted on the S drive. Even though it doesn't say D1, SpartaOS think it's, thinks it's the first drive in the series or in the serial chain, and it's given me a directory of that, okay? So what I'm gonna show you now is how we go in and through this S drive, max interface, we mount a drive image onto one of these drives. So the way you do that is, uh, believe it or not, there's three areas of touch here on this screen. You can touch on the drive letter, you can touch in the middle on the name, and you can touch on this little square with a red line through it. And this here allows you to mount an image. So let's click this, and now you can see the directory of the S drive, uh, excuse me, of the uh, SD card. I'm going to go ahead and mount um, what I have is as a hard drive ATR file. So I pick that ATR file and I press OK. And now you can see D1 is set to the image file name hd1.atr. Let's go back to the computer. And let's type directory and what did it do oh okay one other thing you need to realize when it comes to the s drive the i don't know if you can see it on the camera but right now the d0 is highlighted it's got a blue background if i actually come up here and i touch this one 
That is now the active drive. See how that highlighted that? So now we come back over here and we type directory in the computer and we actually get, sorry I have to keep switching back and forth, but I want you guys to have this in focus. Now this here represents this HD1 image that I use for my programming. So you can see here I've got two directories. I've got um, ASM for my assembly source code. Okay. Let's go back up a directory. Switch it to basic. Do a directory of that. And you can see my basic programs. Let me change the prompt here to something that's a little bit more um, tells us a little bit more about where we are. Okay. So as you guys can see, I'm working right now with the Atari with a virtual drive. Drive one is hd1.htr. Now, this image file, I think I told you in the open video, I created using a program called RESPQT, which is a serial uh, SIO to PC solution. I'll show you that in a few, in a few minutes here. But you can see here 65,148 free sectors. This image file in itself has a total bytes of 16,776,960. 16,776,960 bytes, which is 16 megabytes, 256 bytes per sector. That is a lot of drive storage for an 8-bit computer, okay? With that, with that one image file alone, I can probably store everything I never ever need to store using this computer on that one image, okay? But I'll, I'll take it one further. I happen to create another image called HD2. Let's select that and press OK. So now HD2 is mounted as drive letter two. And I use HD2 as a backup for HD1. So in other words, I'll use HD1 throughout the week and I'll be copying stuff to it and I'll write programs and I'll save my, my source code to it. But then I will, at the end of the week, back it up to HD2. So in other words, I've got a primary hard drive and a backup hard drive, okay? That's where this S Drive Max shines. Four drives emulating, and as you can see, you can create a very large image file and store um, files on this S Drive Max. And the great thing about this S Drive Max is on this 130XE, I do not have any external power I just have it connected directly to the Tari, and I can go on the road with this. I can go to shows. I can go, you know, to friends, you know, houses if we're doing, you know, some type of a Tari exchange, you know, or trading programs or ideas or what have you. All I have to do is take this S Drive Max with me. I don't have to carry the hard drive or the uh, floppy drive around with me. It's a real easy solution. And again, I've got it coupled with my Sparta DOS cartridge. I've got everything I need right here to run the Atari computer efficiently, effectively, without a bunch of cables. Um, a great, great solution. So let me switch back to autofocus here so we can take a further look at this interface. So anyway, I think I've talked about the four drives. We know what drive zero is. If you've got it on drive zero and you can boot the computer, you get that internal S drive image that allows you to then mount images, you know, through the computer, not going through the interface. But let me show you how you unmount these, okay? So if I wanted to unmount these images, I would basically click on the drive letter, D2, and as you can see, it switched to empty, okay? If I wanna unmount D1, there it goes, empty. So now if we type directory on D2, drive not present doesn't it doesn't it's, a, it's almost as if we turn the hard drive off it's gone we can go to d1 as well drive not present so it's as almost as if we turn the hard drives off again we go back to the red the black square with the line through it we choose our hard drive image okay let's do that again black square with line through it choose the image file Hit OK. Now we go back to the computer directory. It's as almost as if we turn the drive back on. It's that simple. All right. 
Down here at the bottom of the S Drive Max, uh, there is a little blue window. They call this, I, I believe they call this the debug. Am I on autofocus? Yeah, this is called the debug window or output window. If you click that, it brings it full size. Um, I'm not really sure what that's for, but I mean, obviously it gives you diagnostic information as to what's happening with the, with the SIO interface, okay? The S Drive Max interface. But again, it's very cryptic. It's uh, hex numbers. As you can see, I've got SIO error three, a bunch of SIO error threes there. I don't know if that's critical or not. I haven't dug deep enough into the firmware to find out how important this is. Let's switch over to drive two, which doesn't exist. See what kind of error we get. We get nothing. Let's type directory and see if we get anything in this debug output. Nothing. So again, I don't know how useful this is for, for actually giving any information other than the fact that it gives random codes and we don't know what it means. Touch the screen again, it brings it back down to the minimum. So I don't know how useful that will be to you guys, but in any event. So there is another uh, button here called tape, okay? And if you choose tape, I don't have any cassette programs here, but if you actually pick a cassette program here and hit okay, it will basically load up and you highlight the tape. It'll connect a, um, a cassette program to the S drive and the S drive will then be acting or behaving as a cassette recorder, which you could then go to the Atari computer and go through the cassette loading process as you normally would as if you had a cassette recorder connected to the computer. Um, the new button allows you to, let me unmount D1, the new button allows you to create a new image. Okay, you see what happens when I hit new? Now supposedly you're supposed to be able to go to the Atari and format that image. In other words, you could choose one, um, but on SpartaDOS, it tells me the drive does not respond. See here, drive does not respond. Okay, I've got a new image loaded here and it's telling me the drive does not respond. Now, I don't know if this is a SpartaDOS issue or if this will actually work. You know what? I guess we could test that out. Let's go ahead and test that theory. I'm gonna take and load in a DOS 2.5 into the floppy drive. And that, that actually brings me to the next topic, if you will, or the next point of discussion. Right now I had this S drive connected to the back of the Atari. Let's change that up. This cable here goes to the back of my 1050. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug the 1050 into the computer and I'm gonna take the S drive and I'm gonna plug the S drive into the back of the 1050 drive so that we can, we can use our 1050 drive as drive one and we can use the S drive max for drive letters two through four. So let's go ahead and boot the Atari with DOS 2.5. Now, one thing we need to do now that we have the S Drive Max connected to the back of the 1050 is we need to make drive one as the active drive. And you can see that once I did that, it's booting from the floppy disk. Whoa, what's all that funky noise going on there? Let's reset. Off. On. Okay, we've obviously got a conflict going here. So I'm gonna choose D1, configuration, save image, save. Hopefully that'll save it to the point where it boots from D1 only. Let's try that. See, there's some unknowns about this that I'm still not completely, you know, cool with. Choosing D1 should boot the computer from D1, but it doesn't always. You see it doing some weird stuff there. Hmm. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay, 
I figured out what was going on, guys. <clears throat> so like we talked about earlier, Drive Zero typically is the boot device for the S Drive Vax. Under the configuration tab, and we'll talk about all of these in a second, there's an option called Boot D1. Boot D1, can you guys see that right here? Boot D1. This can be highlighted or unselected or unselected. So if you're gonna be using a floppy drive connected to the computer and then the S drive connected to the back of the floppy drive, and you wanna be able to boot from that D1, you need to select that Boot D1, press Save, and now when we turn off and on, we're gonna boot from the floppy drive. See the light? We're booting from the floppy drive, okay? And the interface is kind of weird. It's like the D0, it's not quite highlighted, but the D1 is highlighted. It's kind of weird how that works. But as you can see, we're booting from the Atari, which is what we wanted. Um, so anyway, I wanted to boot from uh, DOS 2.5 because I wanted to see that so D1 we're not gonna to touch because D1 is our physical drive. I wanted to go to D2 and I wanted to basically have D2 highlighted and then I'm gonna click select new, which now here's the other thing to know about the S drive, which kind of drives me crazy, but every time you touch a drive, it becomes D1. So in other words, I told this new on what was D2, and just by the fact of touching it, it's now D1. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to touch back up here on the top one, and now that made D1 empty and D2 new. I have a different opinion on how this interface should work, but we're stuck with the way it is right now. But in any way, I, I accomplished the goal of what I want to test, and that is I have drive two, virtual drive two as a new image, and I wanna see if Sparta DOS wouldn't touch it. I want to see if this uh, DOS 2.5 will actually allow me to format it. So let's do format with command I. Let's do, all right, can I do D2 here? And did it actually work? Well, it is actually formatting, guys. You can see here, excellent. And it actually named it stmx0001.atr. Let's see if we can get a directory of that. Okay, let's try that again. D2. There you go. 999 plus free sectors. So I'm assuming that that formatted this guy double density because with DOS 2.5, you've got a format single and I believe the format disk does the double, but okay, cool. So anyway, we've got an image, sdmx0001.atr. Now, I'm gonna assume, <laughs> you know what they say about assume, I'm gonna assume that it wrote that ATR image to the SD card, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I guess there's only one way to find out, and that is to turn this thing off and on and see if it actually saved it. So. Just for laughs, I'm gonna to go to configuration. There's a button down here that says save IM. And I'm gonna assume that stands for save image file. So I'm gonna click that so it's highlighted. And then I'm gonna click save. And I'm gonna hope and assume that this new image file was saved to the Atari. The other thing I'm gonna do is now I'm gonna choose D0 as the boot device. And I'm gonna see if we could turn this computer off and on and boot to the S drive. Let's see what happens. Okay, it's booting from D1, which tells me that I didn't save the configuration. Apparently what has to happen is every time you change something on this interface, you need to save that configuration to the device for it to take effect the next time you start. So what I'm gonna do is D0, configuration, save, save. Now, Let's see if that actually saves the configuration where I turn it off and on and it actually boots from the S drive. Nope, it's booting from D1 again. Oh, I know why now. <laughs> again, this goes back to the, the interface here, which I'm not a big fan of. There's a lot of confusing factors of this. And this is the reason why I wanted to make this video. Let's go back to configuration. There's a boot D1. Let's unselect boot D1. Let's exit 
let's make sure D0 is selected, configuration, save image, save. Hopefully now this will allow us to boot from the S Drive Max again and not the external floppy. Let's see if that got it to work. And it's still booting from D1. So uh, this is one of those annoying things about this S Drive Max uh, that I just can't stand. And that is, it's just the way that it operates and the way the menu functions. Um, D0 configuration. See, again, it's set to boot D1 and I told it save configuration. It's not highlighted save. So I'm not really sure what I have to do in order to make this stick. Let's try it again. Okay. Well, apparently that works because it's not booting from D1. However, it's also not booting from D0. You can see the D1 option is not selected. And for some reason, there is a conflict between D1 and this D0 because neither one of them are booting now. So apparently there's a problem booting this internal D0. Well, you know what? Let's try this. Let's turn D1 off so it doesn't see it. Let's try it that way. Maybe that's the trick. There we go. Okay. So you have to have D1 off in order to boot D0 here. Okay, good. So this is what I wanted to see. This is that new image file that I created through this interface uh, and formatted, sdmx 0001atr So let's see now that I created that image through DOS 2.5. I'm not a big fan of DOS 2.5. Let's see if I can get to that image through Sparta DOS. So let's boot through Sparta DOS cartridge, which I know it will take control over no matter what I do. And you can see my image, that new image that I created is still set as drive two. Let's go to drive two. I'm pretty sure Sparta DOS will read DOS 2.5 disk, but not vice versa. And it does. Okay. 707. So now what I, if I wanted to work with Sparta DOS, I could go ahead and format unit two, volume, call it whatever, new. The skew, we're going to do high speed, high speed skew. Density, we're going to do, let's do double. The mode is Sparta, tracks 40, let's format. Insert the disk, press enter. Drive cannot run high speed, error in formatting disk, okay. Um, let's do standard skew, format. Error in formatting disk. <laughs> okay. Let's get out of this. Did we did we blow the format up? Okay. No, we didn't. All right, well, there you go. At least we were able to format the image using DOS 2.5, but apparently I cannot format this with the Sparta DOS, which is kind of weird. Let me try that one more time. Unit two. Let's do mode Atari, SKU standard, 40 tracks, format, error and formatting disk. Okay, lovely. Well, that's something I'm gonna have to look into and in finding out how we can format these images um, with SpartaDOS. Apparently SpartaDOS and this device do not like to work together as far as formatting those images, but in any event, uh, we can use the image with Sparta DOS because I know that Sparta DOS will read the 2.5 format. But anyway, so that's how you can create a new image through this device. I'm going to show you a, a way to create the image the way I did it, which I think works out a lot better than creating it through this device. Um, but anyway, let's, let's finish talking about the interface on the S Drive Max. Let's go into the configuration button. Now, rotate. Um, I really don't know what rotate does. I haven't figured that out yet, so I'm gonna leave that up to you guys to put that in the comments if you figure out what that means. Um, I don't know if that means rotating the image files upon boot up or what have you. Scroll, don't really know what that does. Uh, boot D1, I think we figured out what that means. That allows us to create 
Um, actually, let's go ahead and test that. Um, I know that booting D1 allows us to boot um, externally from the external drive when it's on, but I think what this allows us to also do is boot from D1 and not the internal drive of this guy um, if we're actually booting from a drive image. So with that being said, let's do this. Um, let's go back in and turn on the DOS here and boot from it because I want to format this drive to image so that it has DOS on it. Actually, let me take out the Sparta disk because we're not interested in that. We want to boot from this DOS over here. So let's boot from DOS 2.5 and let's write the DOS files to this image file that we have on D2 so that we can try then mounting this image on D1 and booting up from it as if it's a, a proper DOS image file. So let's go ahead and write DOS files for drive two. So now we're actually, this new image that we created, we're writing the DOS to it so we can actually try booting from it. Okay. So now, let's go ahead and unmount this drive from D2. And the way we do that is we click on the drive letter. Let's mount it on D1. So there's our new drive image mounted on D1. We've got our configuration to boot from D1. I'm gonna turn the external drive off. We're gonna shut the computer off and we're gonna see if we can actually boot now from that new image that we created. And it did not work. So what did I do wrong? Let's unmount it, mount it. Let's go to config, save image, save. And I believe that will now allow us to boot from this image's drive one. There we go. So now we're booting from that image, which is a DOS 2.5 disk. And there we go. You can see how fast it is. There you go. DOS awesome, and dupe. 931 free sectors. So that allowed us to create a new drive image, format it with DOS, write the DOS files, mount it as D1, and then boot the computer as it's D1, okay? Did everybody follow along with that? I hope I explained all of that correctly. Okay, um, back to the configuration. So we know what boot D1 does. Now 1050, what that option does, according to the documentation that I received, is, where did I see that? The 1050 option in config menu uses timing for 1050 drives, drive on ATX files instead of 810. So apparently the timing, if, you, if you're gonna be emulating an 810 drive, which I don't know why you would want to, but maybe there's some games that are only compatible with an 810 drive, you would wanna deselect this option, okay? You would want to deselect that, and then it would it would make this operate as an 810 drive. But for all intents and purposes, why not emulate a 1050 drive? Okay. Um, this blank <laughs> again. I don't know what that option means. I'm looking at the documentation that I got with this, and well, you know what? Let's go through this documentation since I mentioned how crappy it was. Let's go ahead, and I'm gonna. We're gonna go over some of this documentation and see if it fills in some of the gaps. On first, on start, on first start, follow touching the calibration crosses. You can redo this at any time by holding the touch drive during startup. Okay, really, let's see what happens. Computer off, let's hold the touch. Let's turn the computer on. Oh, okay. So what we're presented with is an X. And what I'm assuming is it, by holding the touch screen down while turning power on, it's gonna calibrate this screen. So let's go ahead and touch that cross here. There's our second cross here, let's touch that one. There's our third cross here, let's touch that one. And there's our fourth 
crosshair. Let's touch that one. And you can see it wrote there, you probably can't read that, but it says X1138, X2513, Y1994, and Y255. Okay, all right, that's cool. So what that allows you to do is if, you're, if your touch calibration ever gets thrown off, which I can't understand why it would, it gives you a way to go back in there and recalibrate it. Okay, yippee yippee. Back to the documentation. Press drive buttons in the middle to select the actual boot drive. On startup, always the internal drive zero with S drive ATR loaded is selected for old drive NG compatibility. That is one of the most horrific sentences <laughs> I think I've ever read in my life. But what they're basically saying there is, you select the drive that's active by touching the middle. Okay, so if I've got an image drive loaded here, Oh boy, did I lose my calibration already? Isn't that interesting? Great. That's interesting how it wouldn't let me select that. HD1, okay, 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 okay. Why is that not working? Oh boy. Well, apparently my calibration is whacked again. Ay vey. One, two, three, four. Now what do I do? Press the middle? I don't know. Drive one. Well, HD one. Okay, well, that worked now. So basically what they're saying is press the drive button in the middle to select the actual boot drive. So like I told you before, by touching the middle, it makes it the boot drive. Anything you have loaded, that becomes, well, I, don't even, I wouldn't even say the boot drive, I would say D1. So anyone you touch in the middle, is this thing auto-focusing? Anyone you touch in the middle is gonna become D1. Okay. Next, press drive buttons on the left to deactivate the drive. So we talked about that. So basically, by selecting drive letter, it basically unmounts that drive image and you see an empty sign. To mount it, it's the icon on the right and okay. To unmount it, it's the drive letter. Okay. Press drive, press derv. Can you guys see that? Press derv <laughs> buttons on the right at the disc logo to insert an image. Unbelievable. That's this icon right here. That's how you actually load an image to the drive. We figured that out already. D0 can only be selected as boot drive, not changed. Well, that's quite obvious. If you want to boot from an external drive, select an empty drive slot as D1, exclamation point. So if we have the 1050 drive and we want to boot from the 1050 drive, we turn it on and we unmount whatever's on D1, in other words, we can't have an image in drive one, and then we can put a disc in the drive and turn it on. Okay, pretty self-explanatory. We figured that out the hard way. Press on the new button. We'll create a new image on the selected drive during the next format command. Well, we did that already. In other words, if we wanted to create a new drive image on three, we would highlight three, select new, it puts the words new in there, and now we can go to DOS and actually format whatever drive letter we have there. In this case, it would be D1, and that would be our new drive image. And from what we saw earlier, it kind of renames that drive image for us arbitrarily, however it picks that name. Press on the output window at bottom will open SIO debug mode. To close, press anywhere on the screen. That means down here, this is our debug window. If we select that, it brings it up full screen and allows us to see whatever debug messages the developers of the software want output it to the window. Touch anywhere on the screen to close it. File select window should be self descripting. File select window should be self, what they're saying there is when you actually go to choose an image file, it's basically like a chooser. You just pick the image file you want, press OK, and there you go. 
To save selected images on EEPROM, press the config button, highlight the save IM button, and then press save. So however we have this configured, for example, if I want drive one, there goes my, okay, so the red light is blinking. I'm not sure what it's doing, but I think it must be doing something. I'm gonna give it a second. I don't know if you guys can see that red drive, red light blinking there. I don't know what the hell it's doing, but it must be doing something because my interface is completely frozen. Uh, what are you doing? Did we lock up? All right. To save the images on APROM, press the config button, highlight it. So however, however you want this guy to be configured at startup, for example, if I want this image loaded on D2 and this image loaded on D1. If I want this to be the standard configuration when I turn off and on the S drive max, we're gonna hit configure. You have to choose save IM and then save. And then configuration, save IM, save. Now upon rebooting, it should come up this way. SDM 0001 ATR is drive one and drive two is HD one dot ATR. Let's see if that's true. Yep, apparently that is what happens. Even though it froze for whatever reason. Now I've got a boot error. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> there might be some bugginess to this guys. Yep. That time it worked. And you can see the display goes a little crazy sometimes when I'm booting. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but it kind of kind of wigs out a little bit, so to speak. And then if I touch something, it will actually come back and clean up. I think there's probably some weirdness still affecting this. Anyway, let's push forward. Uh, blah, 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 blah. If you want to, all, if you want also to boot from drive one by default, Highlight the boot D1 button two before pressing, before pressing, pressing save. How hard is it to spell check this, guys? We figured that out already too because we booted from D1 before. The 1050 option in config menu uses timing for 1050 drive on ATX files instead of 810. We talked about that. Do not power off while the red signal on the top left of the screen appears. Then the right cache was not written to SD. There's a little red button, a little red LED up here or a circle. Once that's, when that's blinking, you don't want to turn this guy off because it's doing something. It's writing to one of the images or saving your configuration. Tape operation. Point the actual boot drive D1 to an empty slot. Some loader, some loader won't start if a disk drive is active. Press the tape button and select an image of type Fuji or raw binary. Hold down start and option keys on the Atari and power on. Press any key to start tape operation after the burp and press the start button on the S drive max immediately. So again, if you wanna play around with the tape operation, I have not done that, I have no interest in doing that. You can follow these instructions. All right. Power, unit can be powered by SIO cable. Needs to be powered before boot. So, thought, an 810 or drive. Can you guys believe this? <laughs> I don't even understand that sentence, and I've read it twice. I mean, I understand the first part, unit can be powered by SIO cable. What I don't understand is, needs to be powered before boot, so thought, an 810 or drive. Jeez. External power supply included if no pre-boot SIO power is supplied. Power switch towards SIO cable for SIO power S on case or away for external E on case power. Do not power externally with switch 
towards T W T words S I O K. Well, <laughs> I think I might rewrite this document properly and save it on my website. Uh, I'll let you know if I, if you guys, if I do that, because this is unacceptable in my opinion. But that's for another discussion. But anyway, I think I've talked enough about that. Overall, I like this device. Do not get me wrong. This thing does work pretty well, even though I think this interface is pretty hokey and can be redone. Um, the device itself is pretty solid and it does work. I've used it now for a month. I haven't had any issues with it as far as writing, loading, and saving files. So I will give it a thumbs up as far as if you wanna get one. I like the fact that it's a self-contained unit. We can emulate four drives. I think that's a home run either way. I think this thing has a lot of improvements that can be done to it and hopefully I might even get involved in the project myself um, because I really believe in it, but that's a whole other story. Now, the last thing I wanna show you guys is how I was actually able to create, let's go back in here. I wanna show you how I was able to create this huge um, HD1 16 megabar, me megabyte partition. And for that, I'm gonna readjust the camera so I can show you the software I have on the laptop here. So stand by. And so I've got the RESPEQT software here, the Atari Serial Peripheral Emulator for QT. Got this running on my Mac. And what I'm gonna show you how to do is I use this software to create a hard drive disk image. And I come across this by accident one day when I was using the software to emulate drives for the Atari. I found out you could make a new disk image here under the menu options. And then there was several options here. Uh, standard single density, standard enhanced density, standard double density, double-sided double density, and then this one caught my eye, double density hard disk. Now, you can see here that the total image capacity for this virtual drive is, is a little over 16 and a half megabytes, which is plenty for the Atari 8-bit computers. You can store <laughs> uh, a lot of files and disk images on 16 and a half megabytes. So, we're gonna choose that and hit OK. That's mounted in here in the software, but we don't really care about that. What I'm interested in is saving this out to my hard drive. And I'm gonna save this as HD1, give it the extension of ATR. That's the Atari image file format. And then hit save. Yep, I've already got one there, that's fine. And then what you can see here is we have this HD1.HDR file. And this is the file that we wanna copy over onto our SD card and then we're gonna use that SD card on the Atari uh, and under DOS, so we're gonna format this drive. So um, let's, let's take this file, put it on the SD card, and then go back to the Atari, and I'll show you what we do next. Okay, guys, so we are back with our S Drive Max, and I've got the SD card right here that I put the um, HD1 image that we created from the RESPE QT software. So let's pop that in the S Drive Max. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on the Atari. And as you can see, we've got D1 empty, D2 empty, D3, D4, and so on. And it also says at the bottom, if you can see, S Drive.ATR not found. That's fine because I actually removed that file from the uh, SD card. And we got Sparta DOS up here at our D1 prompt. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and mount that image that I just created, um, that hard drive image. And there it is, HD1. And I'm gonna hit OK. And I'm gonna also hit the configuration button to save the image. And then save, so that that will stay as far as the configuration. Now, this is that 16 and a half megabyte um, image file that we talked about. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go Let's focus over to SpartaDOS real quick. Actually, it looked like it focused for me, so that's fine. Let's go ahead and type the format command. Now, before, um, when we tried to do this format command, it failed on us, okay? You choose the unit number here. I'm using one for drive one. Um, volume name, I'm gonna call it HD1. Now, as far as all these skew parameters, the density, the mode, Sparta, the tracks, all that, we're gonna ignore all, the, ignore all that. I'm not even gonna do a format command. What I'm gonna do is this command right here called build directory. And from what my experience tells me is that the build directory basically builds the directory structure on the, um, on the image file so that you can use it um, as, a, as a drive, even though it's not actually formatting it, okay? So let's go 
build directory, it tells me unit is not a floppy disk. Are you sure? I say yes. Caution, destroys all old data. Are you sure? Yes. There it goes, writing directory. You can see we've got activity here. A little red light right there. Okay, directory written. Okay, so just that quick. Now when we come back over here and we get our directory up, we've got a volume HD1 and we've got 65,497 free sectors. If we do a check disk on that, you'll see that total bytes, 16,776,960, okay? So that's pretty cool. So, so let's go ahead and make a directory. I'm gonna make a directory called ASM. I'm gonna make a directory called basic. And these are two main directories that I use all the time for storing my programs and my source code. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna put a, a couple floppies in that I keep source code. Uh, we're gonna do Mac 65 assembly because I know I've got some Mac 65 assembly on here. And what I'm gonna have to do here is I'm gonna have to actually hook the 1050 drive back up. So let's turn off the S drive and the 8-bit. Let's take the 1050 drive and plug it to the back of the Atari. And then let's take our S drive and reconnect it to the back of the 1050. There we go. All right, so apparently my Mac 65 assembly disk, this copy here is empty. I thought there was listing on it, but there's not. So we're gonna change over to my basic floppy drive, floppy disk. And we're gonna try and copy these source code files to the basic directory on the S drive max. So let's do a copy everything to D2 uh, basic and let's see what we get. Okay, so there we go. We're actually reading from the floppy and we're writing to that hard drive image that we called HD1. All right, so this is a good way to set up the image file that we created from the RESPEQT. We copied it to the, the, S, uh, the SD card. We mounted it inside here and then we formatted it. Well, we didn't, have, we didn't actually format it. We did a build directory with Sparta DOS. Now, the format command does work from the Atari DOS. For some reason, the format command doesn't work from Sparta DOS, but uh, from what I found, that build directory command actually builds the directory structure on the image and it's good enough to actually use it for um, storing files on it. So we'll go ahead and let this run and then um, we'll check and see how many how many free sectors we have after. Okay, so our copy is complete. So let's switch back over to the S drive max drive. Let's pull the directory up. Let's switch over to basic directory. And there we go. So we copied all the source, co source code files from the floppy drive to that directory. And we've got um, 65,320 free sectors. All right. So anyway, I think I've talked enough about this device. <laughs> I think you guys get the point. It's a good device. I think you should order one. Um, I'll put the link again on the screen where you can order yourselves one of these and you can use it to store all your programs, your source code listings, your games, whatever you have, whatever you might have. Um, you can order these in different colors. You can put them in different housings. You can 3D print your own case. So anyway, that's that. Hope you guys liked the video. Make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care, peace out, go Atari.